Hello there and welcome to another MLC webinar. This is I Can See Me Now and I'm Mac Bunton and I'm a consultant here at the Mississippi Library Commission. And I have been a, con a librarian for over 27 years and I am a longtime employee of the Library Commission. And my major professional interests are trustee training and library law, especially Mississippi library law and uh, a dash of statistics just for spice. And currently, I do a lot of advocating for equity, diversity, and inclusion, otherwise known as EDI, in all facets of librarianship and library services as a social justice issue. And I have accepted uh, a two-year appointment through the American Library Association to their Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Assembly. And I am the founder of the Mississippi Library Association's Social Justice Roundtable, or at least one of the two co-founders. This particular um, presentation was uh, originally intended for delivery at the Fabie Kegler Children's Book Festival in Hattiesburg back in April 2020, a version thereof. Right, this not exactly the same uh, presentation. That event was canceled due to COVID, and this webinar goes over my thought process that I had when developing the original material and the results of that content and some extra things that I've been thinking about since that time. So let's get to it. <sighs> the premise. Uh, is that there are unserved and underserved persons in our library communities and they are unseen by most of us and they do not appear in census data or surveys but they're still there and there are a lot of invisible groups out there but um, I'm focusing on children and this is the beginning of I think probably what could be an uncomfortable conversation because as a society we are not acclimated to seeing difference nor are we acclimatized to responding favorably to difference so somehow we're like oh if we don't see it and we don't acknowledge that it's there it does not exist well they're still there and we go about our lives and we just think that everything is all good is all well you know and we don't think outside of our own little world right but like all things you know I want you to remember that readers are created right and they must be nurtured right they must be grown right they must be fed and if we're busy ignoring them for whatever reason we're missing out on nurturing these children and i uh, would like for us to confront that in our lives and in our professional lives especially so let's talk about it and here is my definition of an invisible child it's a this is a child who never or seldom sees themselves in the literature and this happens more than we would like to think about i know that it definitely applies to me and so i ask you to think about why is a child not reflected in the literature why are they not reflected in your collection right? and <clears throat> There are several reasons that come to my mind. Children's literature is historically happy, right? It is skewed to be sunshine and light because, right, it's children. And to me, that makes it have a tendency to be lacking in depth as if children were all the same somehow, right? And they couldn't possibly live in a complex world. So I want to challenge you 
to start thinking about this. And I would like to help you to identify some materials in your collection that will speak to these children and to challenge you to hold space for these materials and the children that they would serve in your collections and in your programming. And later on in this presentation, I'll have some newer titles uh, that I can identify for you that I think will help you to update your collections. So let's talk about this concept of holding space. Um, the, you have to remember the challenge, right? It's not about you. It is about someone else. And the someone else could be someone unknown to you. But can you make space in your library for somebody that you haven't even identified yet? Um, can, how can you serve these patrons? And to me, it's somewhat like the uh, 1989 movie Field of Dreams. And the refrain, remember, if you build it, he will come. And we heard it over and over again. And you didn't understand why. And so you may not attract the target audience that you're attempting to reach the first time or the second time that you try. But that doesn't mean that you should give up, right? It takes time to build a, a clientele. And these potential patrons that I'm talking about right now, right? They're already disenfranchised. So please, please do not give up too quickly. It is important for you and your library to hold space for these people that may not have come through your doors yet. But if you're prepared to receive them and serve them, they will come. So, let's talk about these invisible children. Yeah, who are they and how can we serve them? What services should we offer them? And should we allocate limited resources to this group? Mm. Oh, very difficult questions to answer. And they are children who are not part of the perceived dominant culture or group. And <clears throat> I can't place them neatly in a little box for you and a little group for you. But, but just remember a minute ago, I just said the perceived dominant culture or group. And suppose you think about a child who only has these advantages, right? The perception that you have. Children's lives are as complex as their adult counterparts, right? But remember, children don't usually have the ability to live their lives with self-determination, right? they are dependent upon the adults around them to provide them with shelter and food and educational opportunities, right? They are in some ways dependent upon the adults. And so that includes you as, as librarians to help provide for them. So yes, we should offer them choices in uh, format and content. We should offer them space, safety, and programming, just like any other child. And somewhere off in the distance, I think I can hear somebody talking about collection development policies and budget. And if it wasn't you, it was definitely me when I was going through this. And I think it's a challenge. I do. Um, <clears throat> Our budgets are limited in this, I know. But our public libraries are there to serve everyone and not just 
of the majority. And so, yes, you should have some allocation of your resources, your time, and your library programming and your materials to this group or groups. Because remember, um, they're there and they probably need you more than a lot of other children that you might see on a regular basis. They are vulnerable and like most children, they are exceptional at keeping secrets. So, yeah, you need to have things for them thinking that one day they're going to show up and there's nothing that's to me more rewarding than when they do show up and they, they might identify themselves to you. They might, they might not. They might just see that book on the shelf and it's there for them or you're there for them. And that's the reason why we do what we do. <clears throat> oh, this is a very difficult topic. Uh, another term that is all in here is erasure, right? And we have to challenge this. Uh, erasure is the removal of all traces of something, right? It's the obliteration, the erasure of prior history. And how this happens, as you can see from my bullet points, right? Groups are removed from the history by the dominant culture, right? You never hear about what a certain group did or did not do that might have advanced everyone and made life better. For example, uh, patents. We'll just take that for an example. It just comes to my mind that might have been developed, um, say, by African Americans. Right? Contributions by the non-dominant culture are appropriated, and this happens. You know, um, for example, jazz. Right. Other groups are demonized and or dehumanized. And th this is that whole concept of difference, right? We are, or otherness. We are supposed to like fear that instead of celebrating it. And our whole country is, is founded by immigrants, except for the Native Americans who were here first, right? Uh, and in the Southwest, we had the, the uh, Native Americans that came up, right? not just the ones that were already here. And then, so we had a whole, whole bunch of melting going on. And other groups are subjected to intense scrutiny and higher standards. We find this often with women. Women are held to a different standard than men somehow. And we, we see this like with um, clothing choices, for example, in school. I hear a lot about how, you know, there seems to be uh, specific choices or not allowed to young ladies and no one has ever said that young men can't do this or that. So I'll just leave that with you. But we as uh, Americans have successfully ignored, if you can say that, minority or non-dominant groups of any kind uh, in this country for centuries. And there was a time, you know, when First Nations were the majority, right? But they were not dominant after the arrival of the Europeans. And so I want you to think about the power structure and how it has influenced the story and how the story, if it is told, is told at all, right? Because whoever becomes dominant, they're the ones in charge of framing the story. <sighs> yes, good news. There's more than Dewey. Um, I think that most folks may have heard that 
Dewey's particular viewpoints absolutely uh, framed how we uh, arrange our materials in most of our public libraries since they're, we use, most of us use Dewey. But the good news is uh, there's more than Dewey and there are the five laws of library science according to Ranganathan. Um, I like this. I, I find it to be approachable and relevant and it did not get a lot of um, play, as I say, in my library science program. But my theory happens to be that it was overlooked for the most part, except for mention, you know, because it was not developed by a European. Uh, Mr. Ranganathan was uh, an Indian. And <clears throat> I think that that has kept it kind of in the shadows, if you will. But in any event, he was a librarian and a mathematician, and he died in 1972. And his notable contributions are these five laws that you see in front of you. Books are for use. Every reader, his or her book. Every book, its reader. Save the time of the reader library is a growing organism and his own uh, classification system. So I really like these and I think if you look at these you can see that yes we should be more inclusive right and we should be intentional about it and that's what I hope that you will be doing. So, I really love every reader his or her book. And so what does it mean? I want you to remember that it's not just books, it's all type of materials and programming too, okay? Books are for everyone. There should be a book for every type of reader that's out there, irrespective of their age, their sex, their race, religion, socioeconomic position, whatever that might be. Um, this particular, uh, every book, his or her reader also talks about book selection, the second law does. It emphasizes material selection for all types of people, including those with reading impairments and differing physical abilities. And remember, we have to keep kind of adapting this to fit our modern lives, right? So there are things that have happened. And as, in a, as a culture, we have advanced since this was promulgated. So we have to keep moving with the time. Uh, this particular law also talked about interlibrary loan. And this is a great way for us to share our resources, right? And I think this was interesting that it spoke specifically to our catalog entries, right? And the challenge was to not skimp on our catalog entries. So beware of fast or short entries, right? And when you're doing copy cataloging, is there something that you should be adding to make the materials accessible to the people that you serve in your community? and open access. Yes, this, this is the thing, right? Library users are browsers. And so open access means that we have access to the shelves so that we can do our browsing. And children especially are, are browsing, you know, and if you've noticed, many libraries these days are going and getting uh, browsing bins, right? Where the front of the book faces the child and they go through it like this. And no, I'm not saying that anybody should circumvent any COVID protocols when I'm saying this. I'm just saying that when we get to the point where we can, I'm hoping we all open um, our shelves back up to, to browsing. So we're looking for something for everyone 
to read. And there should be a wide range of appeal. And remember that if I said that <clears throat> when I think about my, my catalog, right, I'll give you an example. I could say I drive a truck. That's different from I drive a 2014 Chevy Silverado 1500, right? One is a very brief entry and one gives you a more accurate description. So think about this and think about the fact that there are, are children out there and adults too, who are too shy to ask for help right or maybe they're just too private maybe they think that they are the only child in the world that is like that whatever that may be and they don't want to feel like somebody is judging them they need acceptance so as easy as you can make it right uh, for somebody to find his or her book please do so this is my challenge to you, right? So a lot of people want to choose their own material. Right? So I took all these concepts and I went and I looked at our children's collection, our picture book collection, right? And I limited myself to what was here at MLC right and I was looking for materials that would be useful uh, serving the unserved and the underserved and I was not really surprised at what I found um, remember when I, I started at the beginning right there's a lot of happiness bright sunshine in, in children's books um, and also, as I say in this slide, a good portion of uh, the collection is reserved for large print, which serves a special population, which is great, um, and our professional collection, because that's our interest, right? That's our focus, right? And the good news though, but because I brought this up, we did order a few new books here at at MLC and like I said I'll share that information later but I want to say that I actually picked each book off the shelf right in our picture book collection and I was trying to find books that would help children to see themselves and so I was looking for a child on the cover because that's that's a good indicator to begin with and I will say that uh, I excluded all religious books no matter the the faith tradition I just excluded all of them and I was looking for an invisible child to be the focus of the book And <clears throat> I will tell you that this, this was difficult, right? Because back then I was, I did my own version of a diversity audit, right? And I was not overly surprised at my results. Um, as I said, MLC primarily serves adults. So I was not looking for just one type of, of diversity, like racial, right? I was actually looking for materials that you would, that I would go to serve a complex a situation, right? And it was very difficult. And you have to remember now, I did something that I thought was great. One thing I did do because I was looking 
for children to be able to see themselves, I automatically excluded all those wonderful books, and there's lots and lots of them out there, children's books anyway, where an animal or an animal child, right, is there on the cover, and it's the book is about them. And I was looking for books, for children's books, that were in our collection on that particular day that featured a human child on the cover. And when you looked inside, right, that child that was on the cover was the focus of the book. And so that made it, that made it difficult, really. Um, it lay, you know, another layer of things. And I was, like I said, I was looking for complex books. So. And this is a thing with me, right? And this did make it very difficult. I was looking for books in which a child could just be a child and not just an issue. A lot of the books that I run across uh, in children's literature and my searching, when there's an issue of some sort, um, for example, perhaps uh, there's a death. It's like all life stops, there's a death, there's never any more happiness, there's just this death, if, if the death is indeed discussed, which is a difficult concept for most children's books. Um, but I don't find that in, in real life, right? My life was not like that. I will share with you that um, I had a, a niece and she was gravely ill for three of her four and a half years. And yet there were birthdays and there were holidays and there was digging in the dirt and the garden. There was, there were happy times, you know, with her sisters and with the family. And it was not all just this. And so I'm, I'm looking for books where the child who is the focus, it's not just on that issue, it's on them living a life, right? because I think that's important. And I only considered materials where the story was based uh, in the United States. I don't feel like I'm qualified to talk about somebody's life in China, really, you know, except for as a child, perhaps, having lived as a child myself. But I really don't feel like I know enough about their culture to be able to say, oh, this is, this is a book, great, try this one. Right, And I wanted books that could be part of a different story, things that are just common occurrences for a child, things about friendship and, and going to school and all of that. <clears throat> so this made it challenging, <laughs> but uh, it's something that I feel is important. I, I feel like children should be encouraged to read for the sheer pleasure of it, just like an adult. And I want those books to be available to them, but yet I want them to be able to identify with the child, right? Not just, I grew up with Dick and Jane, right? And everything is all sunshine and all of that. And life is not like that for most of us. So I'm looking for books that I, I think are more of a reality for most children, okay? And the reason like I could do uh, you not uh, considered materials where the story was based in the United States, most of those are published in, those, in this country. So it makes it easier for libraries and librarians to acquire the book and it makes a better chance that you'll find that book in, in a library somewhere near you. And I just want you to remember that children like adults 
uh, usually have lots of different things going on in their life. And children who are facing the worst illnesses imaginable can also have great joy and love in their lives. So, my results, um, overall, it wasn't too bad, really. Uh, about 10% of our collection um, met my initial criteria. And then, you know, when I, I did those last three, you know, I published in the United States, uh, my results fell to only 7%. And I think that in many respects that the numbers are as high as they are because uh, the Library Commission uses award list as collection tools. Things like the Newberry Medal and the Coretta Scott King Award and the Pura Bel Prey Award, for example. I will say that um, a lot of the diversity that I saw was mostly racial and that was focused on African Americans Mm, that didn't surprise me either. Uh, African American would be the largest uh, minority group in this state. And in some areas, it, depending on where you are in the state, they're a majority, right? Um, but when I will say that I was looking closely at the collection, I didn't find too much there that spoke to issues, right, that were confronting our youth. When we think about children, and I say we, and that's adults, right, we want to protect children, and I totally understand that, and yet there are staggering statistics about children in dealing with hunger and homelessness, whatever. And in this state, in Mississippi, over 28% of children under the age of 18 live in poverty. And that's according to the census.gov. So Mississippi has the highest rate of childhood food insecurity in the United States, according to Feeding America. So there's some issues that we just cannot gloss over. They're there. I guess we can choose not to serve, but why would we choose not to serve? So here you go. And this is, you know, a report card. Um, on Mississippi, and as you can see, our composite rank is, is 49, where one is best and 50 is worst. And we're not doing good. And so this report card looks at uh, child homelessness nationally, right, in the 50 states and in the District of Columbia. And oh, this just, this hurts my heart. Right, this hurts my heart. And I, I want you to, to think about this when you're selecting materials for your collection. And remember, a public library or a school library, they're open to, to all <laughs> the children, right? And so you'll have children who are facing these issues of of homelessness and hunger and poverty and sickness in your facilities looking at your collections. And so you, I'm going to challenge you to acquire materials to serve these, these children who are in your area. And this is what ALSA has to say. That's the Association for Library Service to Children. And uh, they celebrate and affirm the value of every community member and works to be welcoming and respectful of people's multiple group identities. 
relating to race and ethnicity and gender identity and socioeconomic status and sexual orientation, religion, ability, language, age, size, and more. And as an association, Alsat believes it is necessary to listen to members and stakeholders when they share their experiences and feedback about how the division and its members can be more equitable, diverse, and inclusive for those we serve and for each other. And Alsat acknowledges and denounces all forms of discrimination and harassment faced by those who have been historically oppressed within the library profession and also those we serve, as these behaviors are antithetical and detrimental to our vision of an equitable, diverse, and inclusive library service to children. And I will tell you that to me, this people's multiple group identities is what I've been trying to say, I call, I've been calling complex in this presentation. So this is a, a big challenge, I think, to all of us, because uh, one thing that, you know, I point out, most of the librarians in public libraries um, are women that I see here in Mississippi. They're also a majority Caucasian. And we have to challenge ourselves to step outside of our experience when we are selecting materials, right? And please do. So I want to say that Alsac means it, right? There's a further statement that says, we recognize that instances of discrimination and harassment are both specific and representative of systemic issues impacting the library profession and the wider world. And also acknowledges that there is much work to be done both by individuals and institutions in pursuing equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we are committed to continuous proactive growth and action to counter oppression as we strive to ensure that all children are served by and can see themselves reflected in their libraries and in their communities, right? Remember, I can see me now, right? Here it is, right? You don't have to just trust me, right? Here's Alsac saying it. Um, and that's the challenge for all of us. But they have support right? And that's, that's good. And you have help available. You don't have to be out there on alone. But remember, you must be intentional about what you're doing. That's one of the things that we've been talking about in our social justice roundtable here in Mississippi, being intentional, right? So here are the problems, or at least some of the problems that, that I've noticed and identified. <clears throat> there are not enough books being published to fill this need. They're just not. And many of us still have a concept that children cannot read for just pure enjoyment. It has to teach a lesson somehow. And I want to tell you that like that first point I made that there are just not enough books being published. Like a lot of things, uh, publishing is driven by commerce, right? And so if materials are sold, it will drive future publishing. So if you're out there looking specifically for materials that serve these diverse groups, there'll be more materials made available in the future. My, my thought anyway, right? If your acquisitions policy is strict, it might be limiting your collection. And the reason why is that often reviews are targeted at mainstream publishers. And so 
if your policy says, your selection policy, it said that you must have uh, two um, professional reviews. There might not be those reviews available. They might not be available to you for uh, a smaller press out there. And this is an issue. And I think this is something that we should think about and we should challenge ourselves to, to look at ways to not throw out um, reviews because I think they do serve a purpose but that we can have a way that we can make an exception if if they don't there. I can remember um, taking a chance on a few books back in the day when I actually did work in a public library. And I was so glad sometimes that I took that chance uh, and added that material to the collection because it turned out that it was a very popular material. Sometimes I, it, it didn't happen, but I also will tell you that professional reviews did not ensure that a material would be uh, popular with the population I was serving. So put all of this in the mix. <clears throat> Excuse me. And last, yep. There are doubters who do not believe that invisible children will come to your library and check out a book. Yeah. Um, what, what can I tell you? you you're going to have to take a chance, just like uh, introducing a new programming idea. And remember that just because no one shows up the first time doesn't mean that it was a bad program. Maybe your timing was off and maybe you had too much competition, right? Or something. So buying one material and it not being out there doesn't mean that it's not appreciated. It is possible that if there's only one material in your collection serving a specific group that you've thought about. Maybe they just can't see it if it's just one one book, right? Um, so think about that. And I want you to think about challenging the people that you serve to read outside their comfort zone, to, to read and discover about people who are not like them, right? This, this is good. You can learn and you can identify with new, uh, different societies and different cultures by reading. And that's part of what we do, right? We, we can expose the populace that we serve to new ideas. And so please take a chance, right? There are some helps to you though, going back to the whole idea about no reviews, right? No professional reviews like Hornbook or School Library Journal, that kind of thing. There are some possibilities that you might could think about adapting your policy and including these. So I have here some tools. Um, the first one, as you see, is 11 picture books to celebrate diversity and look, PBS Kids for parents. Most, I think, uh, of us would think that we could trust PBS, I think. And so that's why I put that on there. And then <clears throat> I think a lot of us these days are getting more and more familiar with the second, right? Where to find diverse books on the We Need Diverse Books resources page. This particular um, website is getting a lot of positive in attention, right? When people are looking for uh, diversity to include in their collection. And this tells you where to go, where to look. And this 
this last one. I was doing, you know, research as you do when you're, you're a librarian and you're getting ready to talk about something. And this was amazing to me. Um, this mother had taken it upon herself to go out and deliberately search for diverse publishing, right? who specialize in diversity, right, and inclusion because she was concerned about offering it to her children. And this mother is African-American and she was looking for positive uh, materials to offer to her children, to share with them as a parent would share with their child. And she wasn't finding what she was looking for. And so she created it. And I would like for y'all to think about this um there are larger publishing houses that publish diverse books but this particular list uh, focuses on some of the larger publishers who exclusively publish diverse books right it might be an imprint of a larger house um, like lee and luck right and so Go and check these out. Uh, I think these could be really important to you and your goal to be more diverse in your collection. And so I wanted to give you some sources, right? Did I go back? Yeah, I did, sorry. So let's talk about it. Some authors are just, they can't wait anymore, right? They can't wait for major publishers uh, to catch up and they've begun self-publishing uh, some titles uh, and there's an opportunity available to them to do this to literally to create their own imprint through uh, for example create space uh, which is via amazon.com and Zeta Elliott over here as you can see an award-winning author whoops I did it again whoops nope went the wrong way uh, a bird, right? She has her own imprint uh, via Amazon and it's called Rosetta Press because she, she's just like, nah, I can't wait. You know, I, I feel the need to get this material out there. And so here you go. In these two books, I will say they deal with complex stories. Uh, about children, which is great to me, right? Yes, they're obviously, uh, they fit most of my criteria. You can see children on the cover and yes, the, the child or the children on the cover are the focus of these books, okay? And this young fella in, in Burb, right? He's, he's an artist and that's great. And I really think that uh, even though it says it's a picture book, um, it is probably intended for children who are a little bit older, say in the uh, eight to 12 year old uh, age range. But that book, this book, Bird, deals with death and drug abuse, you know, as it affected uh, a family, right? And I think it would make a great graphic novel. Just, just my own two cents, I really do. And this other book, right? Benny Doesn't Like to Be Hugged, right? It's talking about a child with autism, right? And his life, right? He likes to play and he's like, he. there's things he likes and things he doesn't like, just like any child. Yeah, he goes to his school and all of these things. And this is his best friend, right? And it's a wonderful book, right? But it deals with a complex issue. And I, and I like it. So think about, you know, this, this idea of authenticity, right? And look for books where the the person presenting the material has some knowledge of what they're talking about. Hmm. hmm. All righty. So 
you know by now that I was attempting to find a wide array of diversity in a small sample. So I can't have everything uh, here at the commission. I did get the okay to have uh, some books and that's great. So, but I want to tell you, it was not easy to select the books. So I couldn't have everything I wanted, right? But I have to share with you books on, that have homelessness, a, a wheelchair user, First Nation, immigrants, body positivity, gender queer, hunger, and a child with some major fantastic hair, right? I was looking for newer publications. Sometimes that was more challenging than you might think because some of these books go back to 1999 and that's not really new, right, in 2020. So that shows you that it's sometimes hard to find the materials that you're looking for. It's a challenge to dig them out. Um, <clears throat> so I was looking for resources that would help to dispel stereotypes surrounding diversity by showing some of the complexity in a child's life, right? But remember, it's still important for me in sharing these materials with you to show children being children as much as possible. Here we go, books, right? Here's fry bread, loved it. And so the experts say it's told in lively and powerful verse by debut author Kevin Noble Mailer. Fry Bread is an evocative depiction of a modern Native American family vibrantly illustrated by Pura, Pura Belpre Award and Caldecott honoree Juana Martinez Neal. What I say is I love it. Right? We witness a Native American grandmother and her grandchildren making fry bread. Right? A Native American food and the fry bread links the culture right to the in the cooking in which links us all together because this idea of cooking as a family we do it in my family and I grew up with this whole idea so I can relate to that right and I like it um, so it delves into history uh, social ways and food ways and a little bit into the politics of it says 573 different recognized tribes in this country so i recommend it and i will say that i like fried bread i, I tried it uh, when i was visiting out uh, in the southwest and i'm glad i did Hair love, yeah, <laughs> this is great. Look at that major hair. Oh, it's a cute little girl. Anyway, so what the experts say is, I love that hair love is highlighting the relationship between a black father and daughter. Matthew leads the ranks of new creatives who are telling unique stories of the black experience. What I say, it's a fantastic book. And I can't say enough wonderful things uh, about the Oscar award-winning short film that was the beginning of this book. And this deals with a serious illness uh, of the wife and mother. And you see the father and his little girl handle all of the daily household activities, including hairstyling. It's great. Um, Zuri, her hair has a mind of it. Um, it. It kinks and it coils and it curls every which way. She knows it's beautiful, right, her hair. And um, her daddy steps in to try to help style it, you know, for an extra special occasion, right? And he has a lot to learn. And as you go through the book, you can see that even though he has a lot to learn and he's not so good, he loves Zuri, right? And he'll do anything to make her happy and her hair. So it's great. And it's something that's, you know, kind of below the surface a little bit. And, and you see it more in the, in the short film the, is that the mama is, is really ill and um, she's coming home. And so there, you know, that's the extra special occasion that is the subtext to all of this. So it's really great. 
but I also really enjoy the fact that, you know, it's a father dealing with this. And I think that's great. You know, fathers can raise little girls too. And I think that's an important thing to promote, right? Fathers have little girls. <sighs> Julian is a mermaid. Yes, what the experts say. They say it is an exuberant picture book. A glimpse of costume mermaids leaves one boy flooded with wonder and ready to dazzle the world. What I say, and you noticed that it was an award winner, right, Stonewall. I see a child playing dress up just like any other child, right? This child is expressing himself and he is loved and supported by his grandmother. And I just love it. And I think that Julian is a lovely mermaid. Uh, I do. And uh, from the fly leaf, you get, it says, while riding the subway home from the pool with his abuela one day, right? So you get a little bit of the Hispanic Latinx type deal going on, right? Julian notices three women spectacularly dressed up. Their hair billows in brilliant hues, their dresses end in fishtails, and their joy fills the train car. When Julian gets home daydreaming of the magic he's seen, all he can think about is dressing up just like the ladies in his own fabulous mermaid costume. A butter yellow curtain for his tail, the fronds of a potted fern for his headdress. But what will Abuela think about the mess he makes? And even more importantly, what will she think about Julian and how he sees himself? By the way, she loves him. It's good. Her body can. Mm. <clears throat> the experts say that her body is beautiful, strong, kind, and wise. All bodies are lovely no matter their size. Her Body Can is a book of poetic self-love and body positivity declarations for all young girls. What I say is I wish this book was published in hardcover. And I disagree with some of the critics that say she is the only non-thin person in the book. I saw um, others. There are some thin people and some not thin people. There's all kinds of people. And there is a wonderful two-page spread of a soccer game that shows an incredible amount of diversity. And so I, li I like this book, right? And according to the back cover, it says, her body is beautiful, strong, kind, and wise. All buddies are lovely no matter their size. Don't you just love that? We should all think like that. It's great. more books. A Different Pond, yes, another award winner. The experts say that as a young boy, Bao and his father awoke early, hours before his father's long work day began, to fish on the shores of a small pond in Minneapolis. Unlike many other anglers, Bao and his father fished for food, not recreation. A successful catch meant a fed family. What I say I see a father passing on family lore to his son, uh, sharing time with him and setting an example for him to follow. They fished and then that night the whole family had dinner together. But I will say I am, I am troubled personally by the posted no trespassing, no trespassing keep out sign at the lake though. Um, you know, you have to kind of look for that, but it's there. Um, Maybe it'll be removed. Anyway, um, I see a father relating fishing in his native country as a child to fishing now and sharing that with his son. And I think it's lovely. And yes, this this is about being hungry and, and, and feeding that, right? And being poor. And, and But it's about a totally normal activity, right? A lot of people fish. At least a lot of people where I am, they fish. So, um, 
So, but specifically, the boy's father, right, told him about the different pond back in their homeland, in his homeland, excuse me, of Vietnam, right? And they talk about there and then what they experience now outside of Minneapolis. Right? It's still fishing, and that's great. So you've got different cultures fishing, right? Vietnamese people fish, Americans fish, right? It's all good. More books. Maddie's Fridge. And the experts say that best friends Sophia and Madi live in the same neighborhood, go to the same school, and play in the same park. But while Sophia's fridge at home is full of nutritious food, the fridge at Maddie's house is empty. What I say is I see two friends who help and encourage each other, and I also see a child trying to hide a problem and a friend who tries to respect a promise. In this book uh, raises a lot of awareness about uh, poverty and hunger. And these are two best friends, right? And they play and everything. And Sophia is learning, right, that Maddie's family doesn't have enough money uh, to fill their fridge with nutritious food, right? And she promises Maddie that she'll keep this discovery a secret, but she also wants to help her friend. And so she gets, she's faced with a very difficult decision about keeping her promise and telling her parents, right? Um, it's lovely, uh, colorful artwork, and it addresses uh, the issues of poverty with honesty and sensitivity while instilling important lessons about friendship. So I recommend it. More books. This is Susan Laps. And the experts say that it's told with insight and without sentimentality. And here's an inspiring look at one spunky little girl whose physical disability is never seen as a handicap. And I can agree with some of that. I can say that I tell you, I do not care for the illustrations. I love the story, though, and I truly appreciate that you do not see the wheelchair that she uses until the end. She is first and foremost a child, right? You see her on the teeter-totter there, you know? She goes through a lot of things, and she's she gets a little angry, you know, just like all children. She, she does all those things, and... She has, as according to the book, it's a wide range of common emotions and activities experienced by a little girl who uses a wheelchair, and that's from the verso. Right? She laughs, she sings, she rides, she swings, she gets angry, she gets sad, she is good, she is bad. In fact, despite the physical challenges, Susan is no different from any other child. So here the authors show a happy little girl whose physical challenges are never seen as handicaps. And the last book I have to share, right? Still a family. The experts say a little girl and her parents have lost their home and must live in a homeless shelter. Even worse, due to a common shelter policy, her dad must live in a men's shelter, separated from her and her mom. Despite these circumstances, the family still finds time to be together. In other words, most homeless shelters separate uh, the genders, right? So what I say is I love that they celebrate life. There are holidays and birthdays and lots of family time. And so, <sighs> The little girl and her parents find time to be together, usually in a park, right? Demonstrating that even in the most trying of times, they are still a loving and committed family. And I love that. I do. This is great. And so, <clears throat> if you want to contact me, if you want to ask a question, uh, doesn't matter, whatever, 
here's my contact information. That's me, Mac Button, right? And there I am. I work at the Mississippi Library Commission, and there's our address and that lovely 800 number, right? It's good anywhere in the state of Mississippi. And I'm pretty good about answering uh, emails. So try me out at mbutton at mlc.lib.ms.us. And I hope I've given you something to think about and some ways perhaps to expand your children's collection. Let me know uh, if you do. Thanks so much for listening. Bye now.